Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome everyone to our land and how it has shaped us. This is a three-part seminar series on the history of CSUCI. I'm Daniel Banier, director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at CSUCI. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute has been in partnership with CSUCI over 18 years, bringing the joy of learning to area adults ages 50 and over through university level courses. We present this seminar series in honor and celebration of our 20, camp, 20 years anniversary. Thank you to our grantor and to our dedicated volunteers for making this event possible. In today's seminar, Dr. Colleen Delaney will present on the history of the CI land Chumash people. Dr. Delaney is the department chair and an associate professor of anthropology at CI. Before we get started, I'd like to explain how this webinar will work. If you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the Q&A, as the chat function has been de deactivated. We will do our best to address each of your questions as time permits, but we cannot guarantee that we will get to all of them. Thank you for joining us today as we commence this exciting and important series. Now, without further ado, I present you Dr. Delaney. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, haku, Haku, I greet you in the language of the Venturini Shumash. And I'll start by saying I don't have a specific land acknowledgement related to that, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, this uh, session today will be roughly two hours. And so I begin first talking about the land on which we sit, as well as the Shumash. I'll answer a few questions possibly before the break, and then we'll move on to talking about actually the history of the human activities and events that occurred on this land up until 1931, so just prior to the founding of the hospital. So once again, thank you for joining us. Of course, my remote control is not working now when it was working earlier. So next slide. There we go. All right, thank you. So I'm a prehistorian by training, which means I study archaeology here in North America before uh, Europeans arrived. So I focus here in particular on the Chumash territory, and I work with Venturino uh, Chumash tribal members. After the Springs Fire in 2013, we found this unusual structure in CI Park, um, and that led me to this path of looking at the broader history of what is today CI um, as we tried to trace who built this structure and what it was used for. The framework I'm using today is actually for a particular piece of land called Rancho Guadalasca, and this was the Mexican era land grant um, that was awarded to Isabel Yorba in 1836. So just this is a map from 1861, which demonstrated the extent of their territory, um, but roughly from Magoo Lagoon down to Sycamore Canyon, up Sycamore Canyon to the top of the Canejo grade, and then down there, down Lewis Road. So that's just the rough area that I'll be talking about today. Um, and please note the laguna um, in the middle of the screen. That's the freshwater pond, and that's roughly where we are today. Uh, the territory, the land grant was subdivided, so later in this talk I will be talking about the northern parcel, which is above the blue line, and then the southern parcel, which is below. So the southern parcel today is known as the Broom Ranch, and the northern parcel is where our campus is. So I'm not really going to talk about uh, everything in a specific timeline, but I wanted to give everybody an overview so we so everyone is clear on names and events that I'm discussing. So of course the Shumash and their ancestors have been here since time immemorial. From an archaeological perspective, the oldest sites date to about 14, 15,000 years out on the islands, and their oldest sites here on what is today the campus dates to roughly 2,500 years old. So they are in control right, of their traditional lands up until the early 1800s when they were removed either voluntarily or forcefully mo moved into the missions, and some stayed on to work as uh, employees. From 1836 to 1871, um, this is what Isabel Gorba owned Rancho Guadalasca, but all the way through the 19th century, the focus of this land where we are today is, is on cattle ranching and sheep ranching. This changes at about Roughly 1900, when we see a larger shift to farming, um, and in our particular area, that lasts until 1931, uh, when the Lewis Ranch was sold, part of it, to the state for the hospital. 
Um, and so from 1932 to 1997, as we'll learn uh, next time, this is the uh, Camarillo State Hospital, but they did continue farming and ranching here as part of hospital activities. And then of course we have CI uh, beginning officially in 2002. So that's our rough overview. But I'd like to emphasize that this is more than just a timeline, the people, the events, and the activities that have occurred here. And so as I'm talking today, I'm trying to pull out certain themes, um, in particular celebrating the first people, whom will be the Shumash and their ancestors, but also celebrating the fortitude and the resilience of some of the people who lived here, identifying acts of racism, which unfortunately occurred in the past, just as they do today, but honoring the diversity and the multiculturalism with a great variety of people uh, who've lived here, and some unusual themes that you might not think about, such as connecting with the region, so transportation topics. And then for me as an archeologist, it's important to link the past with the present. So that's our brief overview, brief overview today. But in order, in order to understand why people are here, uh, both the Shumash, but as well as um, the later settlers and immigrants, we have to consider the ecology and the hydrology of the Oxnard Plain. So roughly this map shows you what is considered the Oxnard Plain. The green areas with the speckles, those are alkali soils. So that's important to keep in mind in a little bit. But the main thing I want you to see, get out of this map is that there is no running water on the Oxnard Plain plain year round. So we have the Santa Clara River at the top and right along the edges where you see the dark blue and the aqua blue, those are freshwater springs. And so the vast majority of the fresh water that could be regularly found on the Oxnard Plain is actually on this eastern edge where campus is today. There are a few other ponds that you can see in the center of the screen, such as around Oxnard. So there was some fresh water, but not a lot. So human activities are therefore going to shift over time. The habitations are going to be focused on where there is fresh water available, but they will still be moving around the landscape using other areas to collect resources for hunting, maybe going to up to the hillsides to collect stone material, things like that. And here's a close-up of our particular campus area. So you can see an overlay with the hospital plan um, and Round Mountain, Satwiwa, uh, is there on the left side of your screen. But note the two dark blue ponds. Those are freshwater ponds that were here before Cayugas Creek was channelized. And many of you may not be aware that Cayugas Creek did not historically flow to the ocean. It actually ended right here where our campus is. Um, and just below that, you can see some aqua uh, color. That's for freshwater uh, marshes. So there would have been many materials right here for the shoe mash. In addition to freshwater, there would have been plants that they could have used for making baskets, for example. So again, to another framework as I'm moving more uh, specifically onward, I wanted to, here's another map showing the Oxnard Plain, but in, in particular where the edge of Rancho Guadalasca was. So that's that red line that's dividing uh, La Colonia with Guadalasca, and the blue dot is um, where we are today at Cal State Channel Islands, or at least me. I don't know where all you are out there in, in virtual land. So again, I want to emphasize, and this is important if, when we're discussing the shoe mash, there's little fresh water on the Oxnard Plain regularly. However, as we saw this past spring with the atmospheric rivers, winter and spring, at different times of the year, there would be large quantities of fresh water available. But also there are few to no trees out here. So, and, and the percentage of alkalized soils really limits what vegetation could grow out there. So while we have sites out on the Oxnard Plain, we most likely for prior to the Shumash and their ancestors, they weren't there year round. They're going out into the uh, Oxnard Plain to collect um, materials and for hunting um, things such as rabbits and deer. I'm going to do a brief backup here to discuss the Shumash for those of you who may be familiar with our local indigenous uh, groups. Um, the Shumash is actually refers to a language. So there are Shumash and languages. So you can see here on this screen, uh, the O stands for Opispeño. Um, the V is for Venturaño. So the folks that, the languages that relate to the Shumash languages are indicated there. We call them Shumash today. And that's actually a term that the mainlanders use for the islanders. It means Mikshumash, makers of shell bead money. And so, and what's really interesting is that many of these languages were actually, or dialects were mutually unintelligible. So in particular, the folks on the island 
their language was not intelligible to the folks on the mainland. And so the Shumash actually had translators, professional translators. And to me, that points to the antiquity of the folks of living out on the islands because it would have been very isolating out there and they would not have had a regular contact with the mainland. But this is the general area we're discussing. And the Shumash, Shumashian speakers uh, lived from approximately Humaliwu, Malibu, all the way up to San Luis Obispo, Morro Bay region. The Spanish in particular um, had lots of contact with the folks in Shumash territory. Um, they founded five missions here, uh, the most out of, you know, in one particular language cultural group. And one reason is because of the high population densities here, as you can see on the upper map. Some of the densest uh, population centers were along the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, and we had we estimate archaeologists do about 15 to 18,000 people alone just lived along the Santa Barbara Channel with about 2,000 living on the islands. The Shumash um, at the time of European contact when uh, folks were writing down these these um, conversations and these experiences, they noted that uh, permanent coastal villages. So many of these villages were located at various ecotones, ecosystems coming together. So wetlands along the ocean, as well as canyons leading up inland into the interior region. And what allowed this type of uh, behavior? It's food storage, right? They were able to create a surplus, which allowed them to live in particular areas year round. In addition, they're living at areas where they'd have a year round food source. So for example, next to lagoons, you have migratory waterfowl. So you actually have species that are coming into the region in the winter time when sometimes there might be fewer or less food avail available. So anthropologists, um, we're about comparing cultures. And so we often create labels, which we understand can limit things, but we do this in order to easily compare groups across the world. And so the Shumash belong to what we call hunter-gatherer fishers. So these are people who don't uh, use agriculture, but I do want to emphasize um, they understood agriculture. They knew about maize being grown in the in the along the Colorado River, and in many ways they actually used agricultural techniques, or we could say agriculturalists used their techniques. They actively managed the landscape, including burning. They pruned um, oak trees, for example. So they understood the management of the land, and this is another way that allowed them to create these surpluses. And of course, here along the Santa Barbara Channel and along the Ventura County coast, they were also fishers. So they um, fished um, but for both deep water fish and then fish in estuaries. And, and archaeologists and anthropologists, we call them complex, and that refers to their socio, social and political systems. And that is an unlike most hunter gatherers and fishers, uh, the Shumash were, had status differences. They had haves and have nots, which you frequently don't see uh, among hunter gatherers because they're usually mobile. But here they were actually living in one place. So this allows them to create a more, quote, complex. And I don't mean this in a judgmental way. It just means that they have more layers to their society and more people interacting with each other. And in particular, having village chiefs. Uh, villages, larger villages actually had more than one chief potentially, and they were often polygynous. Uh, females, women were chiefs, but we don't, I haven't seen any record of them having multiple husbands. But we do know that chiefs in different regions, there are, sorry, they would have wives at, if they had multiple wives, they were living in different villages. And this makes sense from, from multiple perspectives. So one for trade, or if, the, if there's a drought and the springs in your village dries up, you can go move in with another wife's family, um, things such as that. Or in, if you're trying to trade with the folks out on the islands, you might need to have a wife over there, right, who can help you um, with translators and things like that. So that's, that's what's one big difference among the Shumash um, and and then there's the cosmology and the ceremonialism, which would take just a couple hours just alone discussing that, which we don't have time for. But they did have various uh, shamans and ritual specialists that belong to the on top organization. And this is one of the items that linked these groups, right? They're, they're living across wide distances between San Luis Obispo and Malibu. But at each village, you actually had members of the on top. And so that's what another way that helps link these groups, even though they are politically independent, which is what differentiates their political and social way of life than compared to ours today, and that each village was politically independent of each other. We tend to have a hierarchy. So we have Washington, D.C., Sacramento, right? Ventura is the county seat here. But for the Shumash, for the most part, 
villages were independent one of one another, but they did have social networking and sometimes one village would hold sway over another. This wasn't uh, permanent. And so mechanisms and, and activities such as with the on top, that is what linked these uh, groups together and caused this greater society and culture that we call uh, Shumash today. But again, I want to emphasize that each village was politically independent. And so today the Shumash uh, when they reckon their ancestry, they reckon it back to the place from where their ancestors are derived. And so what allowed all this to happen, right? And part of it was where we live, right? And here in Southern California, and we have different uh, coastal eddies and you know, cold water and warm water coming together. So you can see the map on the right. Um, this one snapshot of August of 2004, but it's looking at the temperatures. And so you see the colder water to the north and the warmer water to the south. And where do they meet? They meet at the Santa Barbara Channel. And so this means that we had a greater variety of marine life in this location because some, some fish and marine mammals and shellfish prefer colder water and some prefer warmer water. So you could actually have a, a greater variety of food sources. And therefore, again, this leads to uh, larger population densities because it allows them to have more access to food, larger populations. So the Shumash, or at least the ancestors of the Shumash um, lived differently than they did at the time of European contact. So what, what, what I'm discussing right now refers to that time of contact. And so what happened, right? What kind of pushed that along? And in particular, we think there are two major technological innovations that pushed that um, and, and what we call the late Holocene. Um, and archaeologists, I think one bit I'll put on my professor hat right now, uh, we use the term BP, that means before present when we're talking about dates. And that relates to radiocarbon dating. Um, and radiocarbon dating takes has to take a measurement from a particular point, and that point is 1950, because that's when radiocarbon dating was invented, or actually 1949. But that gets cumbersome. And so I just tell my students, uh, just knock off 2000. So if we say that something is... Um, 3,000 years old, and you're knocking off 2,000 years, right, then we're looking at 1,000 um, BC, right? So that's the way we do it. So basically, 1,500 years ago, it's 2,000. So for the plank canoes, we're talking 500 AD, right? So, so fishing intensification. So we know archaeologically, right, and through oral tradition, um, that the Shumash um, fished across the different habitats. So they're fishing from the shore, they're fishing in the estuaries, possibly with nets, and they're doing deep sea fishing. But one big intensification occurred um, about 2,500 years ago, and that was the invention of the circular shell fish hook, right? Um, and so this allowed a whole new food source to open up, and that's in the kelp beds, because traditional fishing tackle will get caught in the kelp, and they wouldn't be able to bring up the fish, or they would break off their line trying to get it. But the invention of the shell fish hook allowed them to hunt, to fish down into the kelp, and it wouldn't do that. So it opened up a, a bra you know broad new array of, of food available to them. So, but the shumash are still at this time still using harpoons. They're still using what are called gorges, these little fish hooks, and they're still netting. So at archaeological sites, um, even on campus, actually we find evidence of anchovies and sardines. Right, so they're using nets in Magoo Lagoon to to get those. Right. But this was a again, it broadens things out. Um, and so, as I've said, it's and it's not just fishing, right? So, of course, the Shumash are focused on, on the mainland. They're focusing on deer and rabbit, right? They're collecting acorns and wild uh, hyacinth, also called dicolostemma, blue dicks, and yucca, right? So there's many things going on. I know I, the, I've been pushing that the marine resources, because that's really what helped push them into this complex social organization, but they're also doing these other everyday activities, right? So they're using bows and arrows, they're creating snares for rabbits, they're making mortars and pestles. This is a, a mortar we have found on campus, and I do have I did have permission from the Shumash to show you this one. I love this particular piece because actually the stone itself, it comes from the Santa Inez Mountains uh, above Santa Barbara. So somebody actually either made it there or somebody here actually went up there to get it. Right. So a great variety of technology and food sources they're doing. And then the plank canoes, right, tamals in Shumash. 
Um, so this was a, a major innovation for them. This is a replica that was made uh, with by Fernando Librado Kitsapawit, who was a um, Shumash elder who worked with the anthropologist John Harrington in the 19 teens. Um, at this point in this picture, he's in his uh, mid to late 80s. Um, and he remembered when um, tamals were being made. They were constructed as late as the 1850s. And so he, they were able to reconstruct this particular piece. Um, and so again, we think they, um, at least archaeological evidence goes back 1500 years ago, and they're basically cargo ships. Um, so before, we don't know um, immediately what they're using, but probably Thule reed um, boats, which tend to get waterlogged. So those are good in estuaries, but they're not great for open ocean uh, transport. And so with the invention of this, they're able to move up to two tons of cargo, two tons, excuse me, and up to, and, sorry, or up to 20 passengers, couldn't do both. Um, but this allows regular, soft, safe cross-channel travel, right? Um, and it allowed them to do deep water fishing. So we know from archeological evidence, as well as from um, oral history, right? In conversations with the Shumash, they also hunted or fished for marlin and swordfish, right? Out in the open water. And it was the tamal that allowed this to happen. It's also very complex. Uh, technology. So I put a lot of words here. You don't have to read it all. But basically, um, it took many, many steps and it took a long time. It took up to six months to make one single tamal. Because first you have to find the driftwood um, and the wood, right? Because we don't have a lot of big trees down here and along the coast. And the preferred wood actually was redwood. There used to be a lot of redwood coming down the coast um, and they would wash up on the shore. Santa Rosa Island, for example, the, the Shumash word for that is Wima. And that means either driftwood or redwood, depending on who you speak with. So they had to get the redwood, then they had to plane it into planks. Then they sanded it down, probably with shark skin or mola mola, which is the Pacific sunfish. Then they drilled holes into the planks. And then they had to take milkweed fiber. We think up to a mile of milkweed fiber turned into thread that was then sewed plank by plank. Then they caulked it with asphaltum, which is uh, tar. Right, the natural tar seepages that occur here. Um, and then they oftentimes painted it with ochre, sometimes decorated with shells. Right. And carpinteria, for example, the name carpinteria comes from you know carpenters and the, the Spanish saw all the tamales on the beach there, many of which were in the process of being constructed. And I like this particular factoid. Again, we say that the oldest evidence of the tamal is 1500 years ago. That comes from, that evidence comes from the archaeological site in the prehistoric Shumash village of Simomo, uh, which is located here on the Wadalaska. So I find that is a, a really important, not on our literal campus proper, but very close to it. Um, so that's special that we have it here. And, and partially the invention of the plank canoe then allowed them to reorganize their society. So they were able to have increase in uh, exchange and contact between the islands and the mainland. And also, this also helped with social differentiation. Because if you were an owner of a tamal, you were actually a very powerful person. You had a good that everybody wanted. And so somebody could say, I need to go fishing. And you could say, okay, but I get 20% of your catch. Or you need to go to the mainland. Okay, I'll take you. But then you need to pay me you know, 10 deer hides or something like that. So this is one of the things that allowed this social differentiation to take place, which then leads to, right, also related to that is our regional exchange. And the Shumash did have, again, status differentiations in these different groups. So there were guilds, such as the Guild of Undertakers, who, um, who buried folks when they died. Uh, the more you paid them, the deeper you were buried. Um, they had the Brotherhood of the Tamal again. So only the folks in this guild had the knowledge to make the plank canoes. And we know at the time of European contact, right, notes from the Spanish, as well as, you know, discussions between Spanish and Europeans, that there was this very complex trade. So from the islands, for example, fish and um, shell beads and things such as otter skins were being traded to the mainland, to the coast. And those are also inland items being sent from the inland to the coast, such as um, acorns and, and uh, rabbits and obsidian, for example, which comes from Eastern California. There's no local source of um, obsidian in the region. So when we find obsidian on the islands, we know they had to be traded there, right? So, um, and then vice versa. So things are going back and forth. And then there's also broader, even broader distances of exchange. So this is um, 
the map of Southern California and note Pimu south of Los Angeles. That's the island of Catalina. Pimu in, in Tongva, Gabrieleno means steatite, soapstone, soapstone. So a large percentage of the soapstone we find in the Shumash territory actually comes from this island. And it's an amazing right stone. Uh, if those of you aren't familiar with it, it conducts heat. It's often used for ovens, for example. So they could actually construct vessels that they put directly into the fire. So for example, this middle artifact that looks kind of flat, it's actually a griddle. Uh, so you could actually take your little acorn mush um, pancake cake, put it in the fire, cook it, and then pull it out. Or for the asphaltum, in order to make plank canoes, right, they had to mix up a recipe of tar and um, pine pitch, right, to get it just right. And so that you need heat to do that. So a great variety of artifacts were constructed from steatite. So a decorative beads, uh, tubes that are used in medicinal practices, um, stone bowls, um, yeah, things like that. And so many of them come from Catalina, but so for example, we have some steatite uh, found in this local region that actually comes from further afield. So again, it's part of this broader exchange network. Which gets us to the shell bead money. So another reason that the Shumash liked, um, or sorry, that the Spanish liked working with the Shumash is that they had this concept of money or currency. And, and I hate to use that term because it's not quite the same as we use it, but it was a close approximation. And that the, uh, the Shumash created this money bead that had a very high value. So they constructed over 30 different ornaments, uh, you know, jewelry um, and things like that made out of shell. But there's this one particular one that was made out of the purple olive, which is the shell you see here. And you had to crack open the whole thing uh, in order to get to one little hard piece. And this piece, they would they would sand down and then drill it. And that was it's called a callus bead but, or cut bead. And that's what they used as the money bead. So they'd string it up and wrap it on your hand a certain way. And then that length had a known value. And so in that way, it was similar to currency. Um, and so we also know it was important because when the Spanish brought steel needles, which could make the beads faster, right? Inflation hit, right? The monetary system collapsed. And we also find archeologically fake uh, callus beads made out of other shellfish. So another evidence of how important this was. But so this allowed them, the, the Spanish and the Shumash to work together. And so for example, uh, the Spanish provided different glass beads to the Shumash in Santa Barbara to help build the Presidio. But it's not really the same as saying, oh, they paid them to do it because it was a social network. It was a social contract. And the beads just simply were evidence of that relationship, right? But it wasn't the, hey, you, you're you below me, you work for me because I'm paying you. It was the friendship was formed, a partnerships were formed, and the beads were an example, right, of that particular partnership. So, which gets us to this uh, Shumash at the time of European contact. So all these little dots on this map are the approximate locations of um, their villages. This doesn't indicate other locations. So again, I said each village, um, each person said what village they came from, but oftentimes the bigger villages actually represented a larger area. So Muwu, the village of Muwu actually represents a larger area such as La Jolla Canyon and the, probably the campus area today. And we know where many of these villages are because of, again, contact with the Spanish, because although we know they did many horrible things uh, to the Shumash and many of whom were, were forced into missions against their will, the Spanish were very good note takers. And they would write down what village you came from, what village your parents came from, and sometimes what village your grandparents came from. So they're able to um, locate villages and, and um, you know, and connections across the area. So we're, right, again, interested here on the Oxnard Plain and where campus is. Campus is that blue dot, roughly. Um, and the village of Muwu, that's where Magoo gets its name, um, was located at the edge of Magoo Lagoon. Um, and I th threw up there just for fun. Kayewish is the word under the red line. That's actually where the Kayegis Creek gets its name, is from Kayewish. Uh, but ironically enough, it's not on Kayegis Creek. It's actually on Kaneho Creek, um, but it's close enough, right? 
So at the time of Spanish um, contact, right, these are uh, roughly where the, this, these were the Chumash centers, if you will. Um, there were Chumash living in other areas, and folks often with different times of the year, they're moving out and doing different activities. But these were the main areas where they were. So now we're shifting specifically to our area, talking about the Chumash, right? And if we are considering where did the Chumash and their ancestors lived, what are they doing, and why? So we have to, there's lots of considerations. Um, so is there shelter? Is that the most important thing? If Are they there in the fall when the Santa Ana winds come through and they'd rather have a um, sheltered location? Is fresh water the primary importance or is it safety? Would they rather be up on a high spot where they can see what's going on around and then they're going to move down to get the fresh water? Right. Same thing, what resources are they using? What food are they going for? So some of the Shumash um, activity areas that we talk about, they're not long-term, they're only there for short-term, say, for example, because they're going to collect um, and, um, plants that are in, you know, season for a particular time, such as Dicolostema, the wild uh, hyacinth, right? Th those are best in, as uh, usually the end of March and April, those are the best time to find them. And then there's Magu Lagoon, right? Because Muwu was the most important village at the time of European contact. But what's interesting and what many people don't realize, Magu Lagoon only formed about 3000 years ago. Um, and so when we think about that, that's such a center focus, but it actually for the history of the Shumash, it's actually a, a recent right, uh, resource that they were able to use. Um, but we see a shift in uh, location to the lagoon as they're coming uh, once the lagoon forms. And again, even before the lagoon formed, there are residential species of shellfish and a fish that they can be gathered just from shore. Sea mammals were probably still coming to shore. Um, but the lagoon is important because of it brings new types of shellfish um, that live in different types of environments. And now we have migratory birds, for example, coming in and certain fish, right? The lagoon is used as a nursery for many fish and it is used um, as a layover spot, right? For many birds in the wintertime. So for example, the saltwater clam, right? The, and uh, not that the Shumash exploited sand dollars, but I put them on as species that use sandy substrates. So before the lagoon formed, and if they're sandy beaches, these are the type of items that are there. But once you have the lagoon forming, now you also have more uh, mud areas as well. So now you have a new variety of species that are coming to form that they can collect. And here we have a picture of all different shelf uh, pictures and names of all the different shellfish that archaeologically we have found at Shumash sites. And some of these they're eating, and some of these they're probably actually collecting the shells for other things, such as making ornaments. And some are probably just hanger-ons. They're just coming along because they happen to be on the, the kelp, the seaweed that was brought, for example. Um, and I have them color-coded. So roughly the uh, blue areas are the ones that prefer rocky intertidal shores. Uh, the the yellow is for sandy beaches, and then the orange and the brown are more the mud flats and things like that. So all these come from the the historic uh, occupations at Muwu, right? So they're exploiting different resources. There's no rocky intertidal at the lagoon. They had to actually go to the other side of what is today the rock in order to access that. So they're still going a distance to get the materials. And today, as many of us aren't fisher folks, so we don't quite understand the importance of some of the fish and what was out there. All right, and this is a picture of Marguerite Welton, who owned a, a fishing camp, or that I'll talk about um, after the break. Uh, but this is large fish. I'm always amazed at the size of this fish. It was called the Jew fish, and it's not from any religious connotation. It's actually because it was considered a jewel of fish to catch. Really good fish. So again, for the folks at Magoo Lagoon, um, there's fish and marine mammals and waterfowl, in addition to being adjacent to the mountains and the plains where they had access to deer and rabbits, for example. So terrestrial species are also important, although often for archeology, span we discuss the marine resources because they preserve the best, the shellfish preserves in the archeological record. Now I'm really gonna hone in on the campus area as well as the lagoon. So the blue dots represent different archeological sites uh, where, where the Shumash and their ancestors lived. I don't indicate by time, but roughly there's a shift. So campus is up at the top where we see um, the one dot with that circled with the white, right? The area in Round Mountain. And so the earlier sites are really focused inland 
Um, and I think that's partially prior to the, the foundation of the, the lagoon, the formation of the lagoon. And then as the lagoon forms and I think the invention of the tamal, they are then shifting to the coast, right? Because you would need nice sandy beaches for landing the tamals. Um, and in the lagoon, you're, you can get away with Thule Reed um, boats and the same thing with the lagunas on campus. But for down there, you, you want there. So they're shifting their habitation based on this new focus to the sea. And the big red dot, that is their village of Muwu. Right. So starting about 1200 A.C.E. after Common Era or A.D., um, you see a shift in the focus is being to the marine environment, at least here in this area. And Muwu, right again, Magu gets its name from that. It was probably Pueblo de los um, Canoas where, when Cabrillo sailed through in the 1540s. And it was both a political and a religious center. And I put those in quotes because, again, it's a different a political system than we have today. And really, oftentimes villages, one village couldn't tell other folks what to do, but you'd have sway where one person might be more uh, convincing or more forceful. And so it, it would shift over time. But what I what is near and dear to my heart is that at least at the time of European contact, and as told by Fernando Librado Keats Powett, Muwu was this religious center, and the Antap group here controlled the religious calendar from Humaliwu, Malibu, all the way up to at least Santa Barbara. So while everybody's always talking about the villages out on the islands and Santa Barbara, because there were three large villages up at Santa Barbara, at Galito, Santa Barbara, and Montecito, but it was little Muwu down here that actually controlled the religious calendar. And every January, folks would have a big gathering here um, and they have a big ceremony. And one of the rules where you had to bring wood with you uh, for fires. And if you have all of a sudden two or 300 people visiting, there's no wood uh, there. But on one hand, I always wondered why, why are they coming in January and stuff when it's cold and you're gonna want wood for fires. It's also January when all the migratory birds and other species are there. So there might've been actually that that was a really good time where they had greater uh, food available to them, right? Um, and then, right, and then the Shumash, right, are forced into missions by threat or by necessity. So the Muwu in the area, most, many of the individuals are missionized by 1810. Obviously, there's a lot of, well, maybe not obviously, unfortunately, there's a lot of disease. So many in individuals, you know, died of European diseases even before they were put into missions. And the Santa Monica Mountains, it's interesting, the earlier missions found in LA, the Santa Monica's became an area of refuge for those folks, who, some of them who did not want to go into the missions. And I do want to emphasize, I don't think all Shumash went into the missions, that there's some still living in the Santa Monica Mountains, there's some in Topo Canyon, um, but, the, but many of them did. And I say they were forced into the missions by threat or necessity. Early on, when the Spanish first arrived, you might voluntarily send, you know, a son or a daughter there to kind of scope it out and see what's up. But later on, by force and or by necessity, most of the Shumash entered the mission system. And I say by necessity because of the way the Spanish um, ran their ranches and then later the, the Mexican government. Cattle were just allowed to roam. And so this causes impaction to the land. So many plants can't grow. There's erosion. They bring in European honeybees, which preferentially pollinate European plants. And so for, for a variety of reasons, for many of them, it's they just can't live off the land their traditional ways anymore. And so they, therefore they are, go into the missions um, that way. But we do still have the Shumash, right? And their... Um, and that many of them still living in the, working in the area, um, even past post a secularization. So the, the missions are closed by the Mexican government, right? And then many, much of the land is then handed out to grants such as Wadalaska. This was a disservice, right? To native Californians because the idea that was that the land was being held for them, um, but it didn't happen that way. And so you still see Shumash, uh, some are moving to ranches to work such as Tapo Canyon with the De La Guerra family. Um, and they have two groups living in Ventura and Satakoy. Satakoy is actually a Shumash word, Saaktikoy, which means sheltered from the wind. And it's one of the oldest sites on the Oxnard Plain. People have been living there for at least 7,000 years. So, so once the missions are closed, then, uh, then the Shumash go out and they're living in different um, ranches or living in these settlements. And so oftentimes they're laborers. Um, 
And we don't know a lot about them because many of them chose actually to uh, hide their native Californian ancestry and focus on instead on using Hispanic surnames, for example, because of the racism and the mistreatment um, that they found, unfortunately. But we do know they're working on ranches and other places. For example, here, Cecilio Tumamite. Some of you may be familiar with the Tumamite family. They're historically from the islands. Um, they came to the missions. And Cecilio, in particular, at one point, lived on um, with the Revelon family on Wainimi Road, which is Revelon Slough is named for them. And he also worked on the Broom Ranch um, because one of his children um, was recorded as being born there. So and he, here he's pictured with his wife, Mary, and, and another uh, individual, and they're drying apricots. So the Sum Shumash are still out in the locations. They're working in ranches in various places, but unfortunately we don't see them often in the written record, and instead we rely on oral history. So for example, I've been talking, I spoke with um, Eleanor uh, Fishburne, who's one of our uh, Shumash consultants here on campus, about her family history, and she's related uh, to Cecilio and Mary, for example. And we know that there were Shumash working on um, what is today the campus, um, and one reason we know this is because Fernando Librado Kitsipawit drove here with John Harrington. They were driving around the location and they specifically stopped and had lunch here uh, at Round Mountain. And so there we, he's, it's noted that according to Kitsipawit, uh, that actually Satwiba is the name of the region and that um, at Round Mountain. And here they mark uh, four houses where the Shumash workmen lived. Um, I'm not sure of the exact, um, if they're saying Im immediately or in the past, but definitely that we had Shumash uh, members living and working here on what is today Cal State Channel Islands. And I love that this map, it shows the house of Mateo, an Indian. And I haven't been able to trace him, but there was a gentleman named Mateo who was injured um, during uh, lima bean harvesting. They had issues with the engine. And it exploded. Um, and so um, I'm wondering if it's the same person. So, and the other thing I think I, I didn't clearly state earlier is that, again, it's regions. So the campus region was known as Satwiwa. Muwu, right, is a region. So you could have been living in different areas and still been a part of that. And I think for this campus area, we were part of the Muwu region because there were no recorded. Um, villages from this location for folks who went into the missions. And so again, that's how we know a lot of places. So Muwu at Simomo, there's one reference to Simomo, which I mentioned earlier where the Plank Canoe came from. And that was simply a, a young Native American couple were traveling from a one part of California to another, and she gave birth um, at the location known as Simomo. So that place name was still known um, into the 19th century. So we know the Shumash um, we're here up through the 19th century, obviously, because they are still here today. And I really want to emphasize that. And that's one reason we haven't, I didn't do a land acknowledgement at the beginning, because the Venturenio, whom with whom I work with, they really feel that a land, in many instances, land acknowledgements are empty words. And instead, what, what is important is actions, and that you are actually forming a partnership and a relationship, just like the original um, Spanish soldiers who built the Presidio did with the uh, members of, of the village at Santa Barbara. Same thing here. So we are working with President Yao and the President's Shumash Advisory Council, right, to actively uh, manage and protect uh, the Shumash cultural resources on campus. So many of you know, one of the first things we did for that was helping to rebuild the trail up to the top of Satwiwa, Round Mountain, so that they can re-consecrate the land for their winter solstice ceremonies. And we continue to do that um, today with my group, with, with Cal State Channel Islands and with um, our archaeology team. So I'd, and the um, Shumash are working uh, with other groups, right, uh, to create their own tamal. Um, and so, um, yeah, so this is the overview for the Shumash and this territory. Um, it's about quarter till, uh, which is what I was hoping for, so I could have some time to answer questions. And then after the break, we're going to move on to discuss uh, the other habitation and activities that occurred here from the 1830s all the way up to 1931. So I will stop there um, at this point, and I open it up to questions. Thank you for this half part. <clears throat> 
And I know I had to do this very quickly. Um, and again, because we have a lot to talk about. So if you have questions that you want me to go more in depth on, on some of these topics, please do so. Ask away. And you use the Q&A. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it on, on your screens and type in your questions there. Okay, so there's one question, is there evidence of how food and resources were shared within a village versus other villages? That's a little trickier to see. That's a good question, because um, when you find food, food remains, you don't know always who collected it. So it could be that individuals are actually going to the coast themselves and collecting it, and others, they're actually getting it through trade and um, in contact. And so we do find shellfish all the way, you know, in inland to Piru and up in the mountains. So there's definitely folks who are who are moving materials around, but we don't know definitely how much came from. Although as part of that oral history, looking at the trade networks, we do know that, for example, acorns were traded out to the islands, um, but we don't know if they shelled them first or not. So, and we do find oak species from the mainland out on the islands. So there's definitely contact, but whether or not it's people going out and collecting it themselves um, through what's called conveyance or through trade, that is a little more difficult to see. Um, but um, definitely, I think definitely one reason that you intermarry between villages is that if you're at, on troubled times, then you can go move in with your, say your wife's family um, elsewhere. It's like if springs dry up. So there was this trade of food and resources going along, but it's a little harder to tell. As far as resources, I just published an article on groundstone. So for example, that little mortar I showed you guys. So that came from Santa Barbara. Uh, now, whether they went up there themselves to collect the rock and brought it back, or if it was traded, we don't know. And there's um, beautiful, if you guys go to museums in particular, like the Shumash Museum in Thousand Oaks, uh, they have these big mortars called, we call them flower pot mortars. They're shaped. And I found some that are made out of dacite which is what Conejo Mountain is made out of and Round Mountain, Satwiwa behind me. So there's an evidence where we may have the local Shumash here constructing um, these mortars, which then they trade it out. So definitely a lot of trade was going on. Um, okay, so hopefully that answered your question. For the next one, others asking if there's a breakdown of calories between the different ecosystems. And yes, people have done that. I do not do that, do that. So I can't tell you that. Um, sorry. Um, but there are archaeologists who break that, that down as part of behavioral ecology because they're trying to figure out why are they choosing different patches over others? Why certain shellfish over others? So it could be abalone, right? You get a lot more calories out of abalone than you would out of um, other tiny little, to little guys like little clams. So folks do do that, especially again, like the kelp beds have a greater variety of resources there. But unfortunately, that's not what I do. So, um, um, do, 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 do. somebody else elaborating on the boats as an innovation. Do they have it from scratch, right? Or do they copy and prove it? That's a very good question, that which I fail to address. Um, there are only two places in the Americas where they have plank canoes. Down in Chile, there's one a group that made them. And then up here, the Shumash and the Tongva had plank canoes. It's a big debate in anthropology. Some folks say, well, the Polynesians had plank canoes. And so maybe they washed up on shore, which on the one hand isn't far-fetched because if you look at the voyaging of Polynesia after Hawaii, the next stop, the way they voyaged would have been California. Um, but I also, you know, that takes away some of the, creativity and acknowledgement of the abilities of the Shumash. Um, so at this point, it looks like it was a local innovation that they developed. Um, the original inhabitants, we think, came down the coast in boats, and that would have been an animal skin boats. Um, and then, um, right, and then the climate changed, and as um, there's over uh, hunting of sea mammals, things have shifted. So we know many California groups made the Thule reeds these are the same type of boats you see up at Lake Titicaca, um, up in, uh, you frequently see in National Geographic. So the 
those uh, Thule reed canoes or boats would have been excellent, except again, they get waterlogged. So you really need more peaceful waters. And so the Shumash and their ancestors definitely would have needed something more stable in order to have regular contact with the islands. Um, so yeah, so we think actually that was a local invention. Uh, somebody wants to know which of my discoveries was the biggest surprise. <laughs> In archaeology, it's always um, something. Um, a, a site nearby, we found what looked like an anchor, which really surprised me, uh, being an inland site. But that was before I learned about the hydrology of the region and before I understood that we actually have used to have a freshwater ponds and lakes right on campus. And in the winter season, they would actually be up to four or 500 yards long. Um, so um, so I, that was very surprising. So... Um, um, communal, somebody wanted to know about communal living in a village. Um, so the Shumash uh, are matrilineal and matrilocal. So oftentimes off, you lived with the wife's family. And so it varied by village and at different times, but frequently each family unit had its own house, but it could be an extended family, but they also had uh, communal structures and sweat lodges. So sometimes, oftentimes the men actually slept in the communal spaces where the women and children actually lived in their, um, in their individual houses. Um, and then the communal living. So you have folks who you understood that you were able to gather from an acorn tree or oak tree, for example, but you could ask permission to do so. So that's where the Shumash were a little different. They did on one hand have private ownership, but it wasn't really private. So in that sense, it was also communal that it was understood that you shared resources. More than that, um, I, I don't really have time to talk about right now, uh, but, and that's actually not my, also my area of expertise. Uh, my focus is groundstone. Um, so there's lots of ah, lots of questions. You guys are awesome. And it's so weird being in this webinar where I can't see people's faces. Um, so the evidence for fibers and textiles, this is a great question because historically in archaeology, we don't see those things. So we know from oral history and from pictures and, you know, the Shumash were weavers par excellence, especially with their baskets. And um, so we know Right, they would use baskets for many different things. And in many parts of California, for example, baskets were used as hats and for collecting materials, woven bags for collecting food sources, and um, and then also for drinking water. So we know here in, in Chumash territory, right, they made lots of baskets. Um, and we find the tools, we'll find the, the tools that were used to make them. And if the conditions are just right, you can actually find them. So up in the mountains in caves. Um, archaeologists and landowners have found um, materials. And most recently out on Santa Cruz Island, um, the Shumash found a woven eel grass, a bag that was eroding out of a cliff face from a, a village there. And they asked for the Nature Conservancy if they could excavate it to conserve it. So that basketry and some of the raw materials, eel grass associated with it, are currently up in Santa Barbara at the Natural History Museum being conserved. Um, and they actually did a formal excavation and collected all the material around it. So myself and Jennifer Perry are working with the uh, Barbarian New Venture New Band of Mission Indians to help them analyze the, the shellfish and the other materials that came from that uh, location. So we know they did have a lot of fibers and textiles that they're using, but unfortunately from an archeological perspective, much of that doesn't actually preserve, um, but we know that they did it. And especially because when the French came through and the Germans and the 1700s, 1800s, many of these baskets uh, were collected and shipped off to museums in Europe, for example. Um, so the question is, did the Spanish enslave the Shumash and other indigenous peoples? Um, and that's kind of a, a loaded question. So um, many were, uh, once they were in the missions, they were forced to stay. And so many times they were beaten. Um, so folks escaped and they were brought back. Um, but other times, as I said, I mean, they were quote, willingly went in, but not really because of they lost their land and they didn't have any way of life. So yes, they moved in maybe, quote, voluntarily that way. Um, but they were not allowed to speak their native languages. They were not allowed to pass on their knowledge to the children. So often the young children were separated from the elders. And so the Spanish really worked to uh, turn them into Spanish peasants. They wanted them to adopt the Spanish way of life. 
So in that sense, yes, when not being allowed to leave, um, being beaten, you would say that they were um, enslaved. And some folks did leave. So a group went up to the lower San Joaquin Valley, for example, they fled. Um, but again, some fled, but then they came back because again, they were no longer in control of their land. And so they had no way of um, making a, a way of life. So then they, they were forced back into the missions. So it's an unfortunate. Um, somebody asks about the relationship again between Muwu and Satwiwa. It's a very good question. Um, so Satwiwa is the area of campus. So today the Shumash called Round Mountain, which is the hillside behind me, Satwiwa. But according to Fernando Librado, Satwiwa actually referred to a particular region. And so I think actually it's this region right where campus is. Today, the National Park has a part up at, up at Newberry Park, which they call Satwiwa. And they will tell you it's named after a nearby village. So I think the campus area is Satwiwa. Muwu, right, is a larger village and region at Magu Lagoon. But when you look at the Spanish records as to who went into the missions, they don't list any other villages for this area except Muwu. So I think what that means is Muwu is the region name. It's kind of like if you're from Los Angeles or, or, or when I travel, I graduated from Culver City High School. So when I meet strangers or when I used to meet strangers when I lived there, they say, oh, where you're from? And I'd say, oh, I'm from Los Angeles because who outside of LA has ever heard of Culver City? So I think that's what's going on here, right? You say you're from Muwu, but you're actually uh, from an outside area. Um, and there were villages further down the coast, right? So there's one in Sycamore Canyon and one down at Leo Carrillo State Beach, right? All the canyons had villages. So I think Muwu was the location for this part of the Oxnard Plain. And Wainimi, many of you may be familiar with Wainimi. That is a Shumash name. Um, but there is no Wainimi in the mission records. So it looks like it was not a main habitation site uh, as of 1782, right, when Mission San Buenaventura opened. So instead, people are still using that location, but they're actually affiliated with either Muwu or Kalsunamu, which is another village that was somewhere in along the Santa Clara River, north of Oxnard. So lots of questions, and I'm probably not going to get to them all. Um, so let me see. Um, so were the canoes able to go to the ocean? I thought, um, I thought you said they couldn't. And then, then you mentioned marlin and swordfish. So sorry for the confusion there. It was the Tully Reed canoes that didn't do well in the ocean, but the tamals, the plank canoes, actually did um, well. And that's therefore they're able to catch swordfish and marlin out, out there. Swordfish is in particular very important for the Shumash. They had a swordfish dance and um, things like that. Um, dun, dun, dun. So it's hard to see how many questions there are left. So I said people lived here for at least 7,000 years. And the question was, which area? So definitely uh, Satakoy, which is uh, that area, 7,000 years, and La Jolla Canyon. Um, otherwise, I, I mean, I think they were here older than that, but we just haven't found the archaeological sites. So, for example, in many areas adjacent to the hills, you have canyons with whenever it rains, think about mud slides and sediment gets washed down, so the sites become buried. Other places, such as Malibu, uh, everybody wants to live there. And so it could be that the, the village sites have been destroyed by construction. So we know out on the islands, the oldest sites out there date to now almost 14,000 years. So if they're out on the islands 14,000 years ago, they're here on the mainland as well. We just unfortunately haven't found evidence of that, but we know they were there. Um, somebody wants to know the percentage of Shumash who lived inland. Um, the biggest villages were on the coast. So you had villages of over a thousand at Goleta, Santa Barbara, and Montecito. Um, there's, there's smaller down here. So almost 200 were baptized out of Muwu. I think Shishalop, which is Ventura, was even smaller. So you had definitely bigger villages, such as at, up at Malibu Creek State Park and um, in the Simi Valley. So there were larger villages there, but not of a thousand people. So the, the bulk of the Shumash did live, if you're talking about one place, they lived in these coastal villages, but you did still have folks inland. Piru is a Shumash word, right? Uh, Santa Paula, Fillmore, those all had Shumash settlements in those general locations. Um, and then same thing for Thousand Oaks area. Um, want to know if the Spanish introduced horses to the Shumash, 
And so, so the Spanish brought horses with them. And so, yes, the Shumash became ranch workers, right? So they're tending to the livestock of the missions um, as well as for the private landowners. Um, but I don't think they would have been allowed to use the horses, right? Without, except for being in the purposes of that location. So later on, oh, after the missions closed, you do have some who become uh, ranchers themselves, um, such as Luis Francisco, who was kind of the unofficial leader at Satakoy. So he was a rancher. So he probably had, he might've had some horses there. So um, in addition to the many languages that Shumash spoke, were there any written pictures, depictions, or symbols left on rock. So I showed that one when I talked about shamanism um, that shows all the different rock arts. So the Shumash are known throughout the world, right, for the rock art that they um, made. So imagery, some of its realistic events, such as ships and canoes, some we think is um, celestial stars, and then some they think are visions um, during uh, ceremonies. So some is, is, quote, fantastical, and others are realistic. And I think I might be close to break time. Um, let me see if I have one more question. Um, somebody asked about how many people lived in the villages. Um, that really, again, varied by location. So the, the big villages on the coast where they had a close uh, variety of resources. So wetlands, inland to the, to the deer and the acorns, plus the marine resources, those had large villages come further down the coast, they're smaller, and you go inland and they're even smaller. But also they change through time. So you might have this place that had good water in the wintertime, so people come there, but then in the summertime and this, people are breaking up to, one group's going to harvest, uh, um, so some of the uh, blue dicks or the harvest acorns, right? So, so oftentimes the villages or people are coming and going, especially earlier in time. So, okay. I think I'm going to call it break time right now. So I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody's question. If we have time at the end, we can do that too. So right now, according to my clock, it is 11.01. So let's all come back together at 11.06 in five minutes. And I will continue on with from um, 1836 on to 1931. Thank you.
Okay. It's 11.06, so I will continue. Um, hopefully you guys are able to take a quick break. Let me quick check again. I don't know why my clicker doesn't like moving. Okay, all right. So thank you for joining and continuing back. So now we're moving on to the, um, I hate to say the term post Schumash because the Schumash is still here, but now we're moving into where uh, um, Mexican American and other groups are, are now have control of Schumash uh, traditional territory. But again, I really want to focus on um, kind of the, some of these themes um, as for the people, events, and activities that occurred on what is today campus. I will also again continue out a little bit onto the on the other parts of the Wadalaska because I find it interesting and also important. Um, but I will try to, a lot of this will be focused on literally on what is today, because I think many of these people and events um, impact, right? People of the past and the events of the past impact what we see today. And I want to bring up Isabel Yorba in particular as someone who was resilient. Um, this is the map of the original land grant. Um, and it was actually very well done. All the text around it describes it. And so it shows the boundaries and why we might not say it's, you know, quote, accurate today. Anybody who came out here and read that were, were able to locate um, this. And she's re resilient for many different reasons. Um, her father was Jose Antonio Yorba. He was a soldier, one of the first um, folks who came to California. He was here uh, with the Fagas of volunteers, Catalan volunteers, and he was in Cal Alta, California as early as 1770. He married twice. His first wife was a native Californian from uh, the Monterey area. They had three children. Um, she and, and one of their children died, not at the same time. And then what's he to do? He's, he's got two young boys. He marries uh, a young woman named Josefa Grivalia. Um, and she is also a very important family. Her, uh, Agrivalia was a ship captain for Cortez, for example. And as an eight-year-old child, she was part of the second De Anza expedition and she walked from Northern Mexico all the way up to San Francisco. And I love this, this kind of this story because imagine as an eight-year-old, she's walking down the Conejo grade and walking past all the land that later, right, would become her daughter's. Um, so Isabel is born. She's the oldest daughter. She's born um, in San Diego. And at 15 and a half, she's married along with her younger sister, who is 13 and a half. Um, and she was married to, I'm sorry, I misposed this. It's Joaquin Jose Maitreña, um, with uh, on the day after her 17th birthday in November of 1806, she has a little girl. And then she and her husband and her daughter, babe, infant daughter, moved to Santa Barbara. Uh, I have a silhouette here. We do not know what she looked like. There are no portraits, no paintings, no photographs, and she was illiterate, as was common for the time. That's another reason I talk about her as a person of resilience, um, because through much heartache and toil and trials, she actually, you know, managed to persevere. Um, so daughter Manuela Carlotta uh, dies at the age of 11 in 1818, and um, her husband dies um, later on um, um, in 1830. And he's a setting contradictions, which also is why she's resilient, but I'll get to him. But the main thing to remember here is that she you know, clearly was a person of her time. So as an archeologist and an anthropologist, I always try to uh, consider, you know, what is their culture? What are their values? And, and that differs from today. <clears throat> but she clearly takes her role seriously in society. While she only had one biological daughter, she, she served as godmother, you know, during the baptismal rites to at least 11 individuals. Um, she's carrying, by 1834, she has two nephews in her household, Manuel Serrano and Francisco Ortega. Both of her sister, two of these sisters actually died in childbirth. And so she's caring for them along with Isabel Leiva, who is the daughter of one of her godchildren, Right. And same thing with Jose Antonio Feliz. He was the a child of one of her godchildren. So she takes this role seriously. She gives the first fruits to the priests. She gives food to the poor. Um, and, and she comes from a very large extended family. Um, Yorba Linda, for example, is named for her brother, one of her brothers. But, um, but she's somewhat isolated up here in the sense that she doesn't have a lot, lot of family. So instead, she turns to the community. So 
Okay, uh, Joaquin Jose Maitrenas, as I said, he's a contradiction. He apparently was a very good officer. He worked to get trade ships to California to help pay for the soldiers, right, which oftentimes wasn't allowed um, during the Spanish period. But he was a drinker. He was an alcoholic, probably prone to beat his wife. And he was uh, jailed several times. And there are many things written up about his bad behavior at work as a soldier. So... Um, but they often sent him away to other missions, right, to do work. And he was involved in the destruction of some of the Shumash villages after the revolt of 1824. So by today's standards, we would not call that good. By the time, right, he was doing his job as a soldier. Um, but again, he had problems with money. Um, Tapia, the owner of the Rancho Malibu Topanga Sakit, in his will states that Maitarina owes him $180. And that's a lot of money, right, at the time. Also, maybe he wasn't good managing money. Um, a sea captain came through with four tortoiseshell cones uh, worth $600 each, and he bought one for his wife. Okay, so what bought one for Isabel. Uh, by 1827, he's made lieutenant, and just before he retires, he was uh, even acting commandant, right, at the Presidio in Santa Barbara. He's elect elected to the Mexican Congress in 1828 but he dies there in 1830. And according to the letters that were written, he was drunk the entire time he was there. Um, and he died re probably related to his alcoholism. One um, letter indicates possibly he was ad admitted into the um, Congress. So that allowed Isabel to get some, you know, widow's rights, um, some funding, pen a pension, so to speak. So they had built their adobe in um, Santa Barbara, their own personal house in the 1820s. Um, and so what is she to do at this point? She's pretty wealthy. She, she for example, got ca received cattle when her father died. Um, and her mother actually broke the will to make sure the daughters received uh, materials, not just the sons. So she's got cattle, she's got horses, but nowhere really to keep them. So she petitions uh, the government, right? Now that the Spanish, uh, or now that Mexico has um, taken over control of the missions and is desecularizing them. So she petitions for this area, which I pointed out earlier was Rancho Wadalaska, saying uh, that it was empty. Nobody was there. Of course, we know the Shumash were there, um, at least before, but you know it is what it is. And I think I failed to mention what the term Wadalaska means. We think it's a Hispanization. So Wada from Wadi, right, such as Guadalajara. Um, and uh, the end part, Laska, it's, I can't pronounce it properly, but it's probably from, derived from the Shumash word for sycamore. And so actually, if you look at it, it's Sycamore Ranch and, and it includes Sycamore Canyon right down south. And if you want to know where we are again, we're that red dot. So we have the Laguna show, which is where Cayugas Creek ends. And then next to the red dot is Sierrita de Laguna. It's a little mountain of the lagoon, which is what they called Satliwa at the time. And Isabel, even though in all the records, this ranch was called Guadalasca, she personally preferred to call it La Laguna, right? Because of the freshwater uh, lake pond that was here. Um, originally, she's turned down the, the, the grants, um, the land grant, because the Spanish uh, priests at Buena Ventura said, nope, we need the fresh water, but she persevered. So again, I talked to her resilience. She, she wrote back and said, no, I cannot take the whole, I need the whole grant because they only gave her the mountain area. She's like, I need it. And so she won upon appeal. So once it was formally granted to her, she started her fence enclosure. She built at least one adobe home initially. And again, her 40 horses and her 500 head of cattle. But again, she's illiterate. So we have very little documentation except for formal um, court cases and things like that. So we have really no direct records related to her ranching life. We do know that Bernardino or Bernardo Lugo was her initial foreman, Mayodomo, because he uh, testified to that in the 1850s. Uh, Domingo or Dominique Abide acted on her behalf at least in the 1860s. And both of them married um, one of her adopted daughters. Uh, Rafael Leiba, um, he was contracted to, to be the foreman in 1854, um, and he's the brother-in-law to Lugo, um, you know, so uh, her sister, his sister, was one of her adopted daughters. And then we know a few others. So Gabriel Garcia, he was foreman in at least 1838, but don't know how long. Um, Jose Caldon 
was formed in, in the 1850s. And that, that's interesting. We know about that one because of the court case. She sued him because the main role of the foreman is in charge of the steers uh, for branding, for selling when need be. And so she claimed he sold some of her steers without permission. And then at the very end in the late 1860s, Patricio Bonilla served as her foreman, Maradona. And I'll talk about him more in a minute. So um, her life in Santa Barbara. Um, she, as I said, she built an adobe, um, very good friends with the De La Guerra family. Today, her house no longer exists, but it's there at the, it's the parking lot uh, for City Hall in Santa Barbara along De La Guerra Plaza. Um, so in various records and stuff, she'll say she has caring for up to 12 people at a time that so she's adopted. And here at the time, it's not adoption the way we do it. It's it's this social obligation. So they weren't oftentimes formal. It's just that, hey, that's the nephew or that's the daughter of my my goddaughter. So they've fallen on hard times. They can come stay with me. So it's, it's, it's a very loose relationship. But we do know from the 1850 and the 1852 census records that there were a large number of Mexican and Chumash ranch workers in the area, but we don't know how many she had. Um, living down at the ranch or would bring in to the ranch. Um, but we do know that she did have some employees at her household. In some census records, there are individuals who don't have surnames. And so those were likely the Shumash servants. But she was doing well enough that in 1850, she renovated her uh, adobe house and um, apparently brought in, had plaster and paintings of Pompeii, the reviews of Pompeii. And so it was nice enough that the city council used, rented it for their meetings. And um, Antonio de la Guerra, a justice of the peace, used uh, probably the parlor also as his office. And in 1856, even though she couldn't vote, um, her house was a polling place in one of the elections, right? So she was a very uh, front and center part of society in Santa Barbara. Uh, the top picture of the adobe that was taken in the 19 teens. Um, the house was damaged and destroyed in the uh, dist damaged in the 1925 earthquake and then torn down by the city in the 1930s. Um, but also talking about her resilience, right? She seems to be doing well this way, but then hanging over her is the Rancho Guadalasca. When California joined the United States, part of the treaty treaty said that they had to recognize all the Mexican land grants. But Mexican documentation um, of grants of, of lands was different than the U.S., and so it was very difficult, and many of them were unsuccessful. And she is a case in point, and it was particularly difficult for women. Um, she was one of only, I, I forget the exact number, maybe 25% of the ranches were owned by women. So she presented her case. Um, she didn't hear anything for a year and a half. She's like she's very frustrated with what's going on, or I guess uh, two years, and then it was denied. And so at this time when it's denied, she writes in Raphael's contract that if she loses the land, she, he cannot sue her, right? So she had a contract that he was going to work for her, but he could not sue her for damages if the ranch was taken away. So she appeals again. And then uh, just a few months later, once again, it's denied. And it's, it's really kind of infuriating to read because it says she's done nothing to demonstrate that she's got the land grant, that she fulfilled the requirements. She built adobes. She has a, a corral, right? She did all this stuff. But finally, in 1857, the decision is reversed. And the, the federal government does say that she owns this ranch, although it wasn't formally signed by President Grant until January of 1873, for so for much longer. Um, but so this isn't the end of the troubled times, though. Right? So as we know, here in California, you know, California's environment, climate, it's boom and bust, lots of rain and lots of drought. And so the same thing happens here. Um, December of 1861 and January of 1862, we have over 30 days of nonstop rain in California. So the same thing that we just saw this winter, atmospheric river and the snow melt, it, uh, the snow melts up in um, the Sierra, the whole San Joaquin Valley is one big lake, Sacramento, right, is just a big swimming pool. And I don't mean to be flippant, um, at least a thousand, or sorry, at least 4,000 people died um, of 1% of California's population at the time. And we do see similar events down here. Uh, a letter between the De La Guerra brothers, because one was living at uh, Tapo Canyon or in Simi Valley. Um, they call uh, Santa Barbara a city of paper, right? Because adobe bricks, if you're unfamiliar, are sun-dried. They're not kiln-fired. 
So too much moisture, if they're sitting in water, they're going to melt. So many of the adobes in Santa Barbara were just melted away and they collapsed at Buena Ventura, completely flooded. There are only apparently four houses left. Um, they note that Doña Yorba, apologies for the typo, um, was down to her molars. Um, it's a new Spanish term. I'd never heard that before. So basically it sounds like her adobe was ruined and she lost everything. And then the Arroyo Las Posas, which is one of the names for Cayagas Creek, suddenly in the middle of the night, it overflowed and both and the, the ranch houses there, the people barely made it out alive and they only made it with the clothes on their backs. So if this isn't bad enough, right? Um, then this was followed by three years of drought. Um, and so here, see here in this picture, it's kind of hard to read, but I underlined the Laguna. Um, so that's where the, and the ranch house is underlined in green. And so that's where those guys barely made it out. And so you're, you have trouble times because you're worrying about the livestock and all the flooding. And next thing you know, you've got three years of drought. And in Santa Barbara, the recorded cattle, they at the beginning of this, they had 200,000 cattle registered in Santa Barbara. And by the end, they were, they were down to only uh, 40 or 50,000. So huge numbers of losses. And then this flows over, right, into other um, businesses and ways of life, right? So mercantiles can't survive because the, the vaqueros and the rancheros can't pay, right, pay their bills. So it's cyclical. Um, this happened for a lot of people. However, it doesn't seem to have affected Isabel. And I think, again, this is how she's resilient. She must have been an extremely shrewd and intelligent woman um, because you hear about others having to kill off their cattle or sell off their cattle, and she was not one of them. In 1868, she sold a portion, the northern portion that I talked about, so the campus area, to her nephew, Jose de Jesus, uh, one of Bernardo's brothers, uh, sorry, uh, sons, um, for a dollar. She sells it for a dollar. And then in 1870, she sells two tiny parcels totaling uh, 10 acres. I'm, I'm sorry, that's another typo. It's one of nine and one of one uh, for $500 in gold coin. So she seems to be doing pretty well. And then in November of 1871, she sells the Southern par par portion to a group of businessmen, which I'll talk about them more in a minute. But again, how shrewd and intelligent she is. Just a year or two before, everything she owns, including her adobe house in uh, Santa Barbara, some orchards and other land that she owns, everything was valued at $14,000. And she sells only a portion of that for twenty-three dollars or $22,000. She's very elderly at this point and very frail. She's in her early 80s. Um, and so she, right after she sold it, she rewrote her will. And she died a week after that. And so the witnesses to her will attested to the fact that she was of sound mind at that time. She was just very frail. And so again, talk about resilience, fortitude. Uh, she managed to hold on to this ranch for 35 years. Um, she was a good citizen um, for Santa Barbara, right? And in her will, she left, she had four kind of more officially adopted children, including a refugia, Abide, and they were left coins as money as well as part of the uh, house right there. So a really amazing woman. But also, as you can imagine, there's also some tragedies and other events that occur here. And so this one kind of epitomizes it. In May 1868, she hires Patricio Bonilla, who lived next door at the De La Guerra's, and he's hired to be the foreman of the ranch. And so they go to La Laguna. So he's 65 years old and he has three children, 18 maybe. That's funny that they didn't know, they didn't know their ages. Uh, 22. And then the one that really annoys me, the unnamed daughter, unnamed, unknown, no, unknown age. Um, and also already living at the ranch was Domingo and Juan Abade, right? So Domingo had married one of her adopted daughters. They ran a mercantile. And in 1865, they had to go to court, right, because of bankruptcy. And so they lost their business, as I talked about, with what's happening to everybody else. So they're living on the ranch, even though he had a, his third child was born in 18, in April of 1868. And this is his eldest daughter, Felicidad, um, in 1872. So in 1868, in July, um, one of the Olivos boys as an Olivas adobe comes to the ranch and says, we've lost a steer. He's wandering on your land. Can we please retrieve him? Um, and at the time, the daughter and uh, Javier were in the house and the daughter hears an argument and she tells her brother, run out and help our father. I think he's you know, in a fight. And Domingo 
at that time had grabbed Patricio by the beard and was shaking him because he was telling him he wasn't allowed to do this event, helping it out. And Patricio and Javier and everybody were like, he's the foreman. Of course, he's allowed to do this. Um, and Dominguez said, nope, I'm going to Santa Barbara and I'm talking to Isabel. And so Patricio told Javier, go to Santa Barbara, talk to Doña Isabel. And while he was there, Javier, he was arrested because apparently Domingo stopped and told the sheriff, this guy attempted to kill me. Um, and so he's in jail overnight. Um, he'd sent the horse with a boy to tell his dad. So his father came and bailed him out the next day and Domingo never appeared. So the charges were dropped. So Domingo never appeared because he had gone to Santa Barbara. So Javier wants to go to Santa Barbara to talk to Doña Isabel. And his dad says, sorry, I just got an order from the butcher from Doña Isabel. We have to go round up 60 steer for the butcher. So they go back to the ranch and it turns out Domingo has beat them there. Um, and when the boys or the young men, Teodosio and Javier go to try to get the horses out of the corral, Domingo starts fighting with them and tells them they have no reason to be there. Um, they're not allowed. And so Javier is really upset because he had been thrown in jail for no reason. Domingo pulls a gun. Javier pulls a gun. Domingo is shot four times and he is killed. Javier freaks out. He asks his brother for a horse at the corral and his brother says no. And so Javier runs to another, one of the other buildings, finds a horse and takes off. And he's gone for 30 days. And his, bro and his father, Patricio, convinces him, please come back, right? Let's go to the authorities because clearly they didn't think he was at fault. Both pulled their guns. That's not how it came out in the trial. And that's why I talk about um, that uh, there's racism and tragedy at play. Um, there's a trial, 77 jurors, only um, 22 were, um, sorry, maybe 70, 72, 22 were Californios. None of them made it onto the jury. So the jury is made up of 11 Anglo-Americans and one Spaniard. And I have read the court transcripts. The vast majority of it is in Spanish. So one of the questions is, did the jury even understand the answers and the questions with what was going on? So he's convicted of first degree murder. And so that's another case here, possibly of what racism is going on. Why not manslaughter? Why not second degree? You know, why is it this? Uh, but he's convicted of murder. He's sentenced to hang. And then the letter writing campaign starts. Um, the judge, Pablo de la Guerra, right, is tried uh, the Charles Hoos, the attorney, the Mexican consul, and over um, 150 residents of Santa Barbara all pleaded for let, you know, clemency. And so a week before he's sentenced to hang, he's sentenced to life in prison. And so on um, two lines here, this is his uh, entry record at San Quentin. Um, so he goes there in January of 1869. Um, he's, and then he is there until 1887. And he appealed um, and it took many years, but eventually he was released after 19 years in prison. Um, and so it's a really tragic case of, in many ways, right? So here's this young Californio. It sounds like he, in many ways, it looks like he didn't receive a fair trial and this impacted his family. And then there's the Abade family, right? He had three young children um, that were then left fatherless. Um, fortunately, she was Isabel's uh, adopted daughter. So, you know, that able to help out that way, but they did have to, um, you know, live without their father. So yeah, tragedy all around, right? Okay, so that's kind of an example. I've talked about some of these themes. And now we're moving on to the landowners and other events and people. So the Southern Parcel, it was a whole series of Anglo-American and uh, European. So the Dickersons eventually sold to another group of businessmen called Hollister, including Hollister. And they in turn sold to William Richard Broom. So we're all familiar with the John Spore Broom Library, right? That is named for William Richard's grandson. Right. And then the northern parcel, a group of individuals, which I'll also be talking about um, in just a sec. Right. So again, to reorient you guys, this is Rancho Alaska. This is another map. But I like this one because that whole white portion at the top, that is the Lewis Ranch. Right. So that's the northern parcel. And then the southern parcel is the various Broom family members um, over time. So what else can we learn from the history of Rancho Alaska, right? And other evidence of the people and events that occurred here. One is multiculturalism and diversity. So historically, we have very few Black uh, African Americans in Ventura County as residents, which I always find kind of interesting. Um, and, and we know the Californios actually had a large, uh, many of them had uh, African ancestry. So 
So folks were here, they're just not as obvious. Um, but I found one census record related to John Mangley. He was a black uh, ranch cook. And this is a picture of the Lewis Ranch chuck wagon cook in the 1920s. So I always wonder if it could be him, right? But he's the only one I've been able to find thus far. But obviously a lot of Anglo-American and Hispanic ranch hands. Here's a case of both uh, groups uh, bagging sugar bean, uh, excuse me, lima beans. Um, those bags can weigh up to 80 to 100 pounds. And Juan Espinosa, for example, he served as the foreman of the Upper Lewis Ranch, which is today Dos Vientos, and he continued on after the ranch was lost and worked as one of the um, workers at, or laborers at the dairy and the farm for the hospital. We had Japanese immigrants here in um, Ventura County, and, but in particular for the Wada, Alaska, they tended to focus on fishing and farming. So for example, Kimi and his wife, Yoshi Kubayama, lived at the Lewis Ranch. They rented a house there and it, they were listed as employment as being servants for a private family. So it's likely that they worked uh, for the Lewises. Many in the region also were the farm workers, such as these individuals here uh, from the Mohart Ranch. So they were the laborers. But I do like to point out that the Japanese uh, farmers and um, weren't just laborers, they were also the ones in charge. So for, for example, two Japanese uh, farmers, Kanan Sato and Yasaku Kubayama, who I think is related to Kimi, um, they both leased land at Round Mountain. Um, in the 19 teens. So they're leasing land from the Lewises in order to grow uh, sugar beets. We also have um, Chinese immigrants here. Um, I'll briefly go through this one um, because she's a really interesting case, um, but not a lot of time. But Chung Wang, for example, pictured here in the wagon, he uh, was a Chinese immigrant. He lived in Santa Barbara. So that's probably where he got to know the brooms because at about 18, 99, he and the family moved to Ventura County, and he becomes, at least for part of the time, foreman of the Broom Ranch. Um, and Margaret Chung is famous now because uh, she's the first female Chinese-American physician and surgeon, uh, but she's also an LGBTQ icon, although she didn't take the title of lesbian, likely she was. She had several close female relationships. Um, and also, as you see in this lower picture, that's from medical school, her sophomore or junior year, where she liked, to, she dressed in masculine clothing and she went by the name Mike. And she continued that through the 1920s. Um, and I know it's a little far flung uh, why I relate her here, but I think it's an amazing story because she later befriended a group of pilots um, and they jokingly referred to themselves as her fair haired bastards because she was a mother figure to them. She was in her forties. They were in their early twenties. They were unemployed pilots. And, but I think one of the reasons they became friends, they, because they had similar outlooks and, and they would go hunting and camping together. And she specifically in her memoirs talks about repairing fences and riding horses out on the Broom Ranch. And so I think a core part of her identity is from the few years that she spent here in Ventura County. And then that led to her befriending this group of aviators and who eventually numbered in the thousands. So if you want to know more about her, I suggest Judy Tsu Chung Wu's book. And I've applied for an IRA. So I'm hoping to bring Dr. Wu to campus next year to talk about Margaret Chung. Uh, also, there was a Japanese sport fishing camp at Magoo Lagoon um, run by Kunsaku um, um, Kubota. Let me see, I'll do a laser pointer. It's this gentleman here, and that's his wife, uh, Miu. Um, and so he ran the sport fishing camp for over 20 years, and it was a very egalitarian place where you had the rich and famous, such as um, Stanley or Earl Stanley Gardner from Perry Mason fame and Lionel Barrymore, the actor and artist, uh, they were there for sport fishing as well as um, just regular folks, waitresses, you know, and painters from LA. Um, and this uh, uh, also other immigrants, the, the boat there is, is captained by Manuel Sosa from the Azores, right? He Portuguese fisherman. And in the lower picture, that's Papashima mending the nets there at the camp. Um, in the 1930s. 1936, uh, Frank Kubota, he sells the, the buildings. So the camp is placed where those two 10 acre parcels were placed. So he doesn't own the land, but he built up the resort. They had a cafe, there's the bait shop, they had uh, fish tanks and uh, Japanese baths. 
And so all those materials, the pier, they built the pier, all that he sold in 1936 and went back to Japan. And they had two other names later on through time. So coming back to the campus area, uh, we had Jewish landowners. So we don't want to, that's another population that is, is um, frequently not recognized here in Ventura County. Uh, Wolf Kalischer and Henry Wartenberg purchased the Northern parcel from her, or actually they didn't really purchase it from her nephew because her nephew owed them $5,000. And so they held a promissory note and they took the ranch, but they were even handed uh, folks. They actually offered him and his wife $3,000 if they could find another buyer for the ranch within a certain amount of time. And I'm not sure if they were unsuccessful or if they opted not to sell because they held on for the ranch until about 1880. But why would two Jewish businessmen from L.A. Uh, buy a ranch up here? They founded the first tannery in Los Angeles. So this could be one reason. Um, so we have very little evidence of them up in the county. So it seems like they were absentee owners, but they were both like Isabel. They were very social minded. Um, Kalisha in particular helped Native Californians um, help them found the Paula Reservation. And Wartenberg founded the first volunteer fire department in Los Angeles because their mercantile burned in a big fire. Yeah. And then Wartenberg dies suddenly in 1879. So I think because of their partnership, everything was dissolved in, in probate. I don't know, definitely, but I think it was then purchased by Louis Sloss and Louis Gersel in 1880 about. And they're interesting folks. And again, I don't have time to go through it all, but they married sisters, um, for example, and, and they're business partners. But again, they oper operated a tannery. So they're living up in San Francisco area. Um, but unlike Kalisha and Wartenberg, it appears that they and their families are frequent visitors to Santa Barbara. So you often see them, their names listed, along with the Lilienthal family, which is another family they married into. So you often see them up in Santa Barbara because uh, so they're coming here to visit. And another topic that many of you guys not, might not be aware of is transportation or think about it. So there's a list of some of the things I'm going to briefly talk about, tamales, the Coast Survey, steamship lines, and railroads. So as we already talked about, the first evidence of the tamal comes from the Wadalaska. Um, and the tamals and the ability to go back out to sea is very important for the Shumash. They built their first tamal in over 150 years uh, and, and went out for the first time in 2001. But most of those paddlers are from Santa Inez, not local Ventureño. So Alan Salazar, um, who's part Ventureño is, has just partnered with the, with Patagonia and they're going to work together with the Barbarino Ventureño Band of Mission Indians to build the own, their own tamal here in the county. So that's associated. And then there's the Coast Survey. Um, for the Coast Survey, um, it became part of the United States. So it was really important for transportation. So they came and they mapped the coastlines, the, the reefs, the islands to improve shipping. Um, and it's really interesting that of all places you could go, the surveyors said the West Coast was the most difficult of all assignments, right? Because of our varying weather, um, mountains that go down into the oceans, things like that. So this is a draft map of, of the lagoon. And at the top corner, it says Laguna, that's Laguna Peak. That's where the uh, military installation is right now. And where that star is on either side, right? That was where the fish camp was focused. But it was a really difficult, um, as I said, uh, job. Their boats were always being swamped. There was one camp down the coast that had so many rattlesnakes that that's what they called the camp. And who knew that baking soda and um, whiskey could heal uh, rattlesnake bites? Because apparently that's how they saved a couple horses. Um, and But their notes are amazing. So for example, they were camped at Sycamore Canyon when the Fort Tejon quake happened in 1857. And they mentioned the displacement of the soil and the San Santa Clara River, for example. So, so those plots of land were sold to John O'Farrell because they were trying to uh, form a steamship line uh, probably a pier there, uh, the Goodall and Nelson steamship line, it never happened. So they did stop off at other places such as Ventura. And, um, but for various reasons, maybe they couldn't get agreements with the landowners, right, for access, or it was just too difficult because the land was too swampy. But instead, Bard built his pier at Wainimi. And then Another event that happened related to transportation was the big storm of 1939. It was actually a hurricane. A lot of people don't know about it. It was a hurricane for one minute, but it was just like last September here. A, a 10 days of over 100 degree temperatures. And then all of a sudden the storm came in from the Pacific 
and um, it killed many people because of the storms. It washed out railroad tracks out in the desert. Uh, there were buildings where the windows were blown out in, in Long Beach. But unfortunately for here, for the Magoo Fish Camp, uh, three boats went out. Um, there were varying contradictions as to whether or not they got the weather report in time or, or they knew about it. One ship stayed out at sea and was fine. Another ship stayed out for 30 hours and tried to land at Wainimi. And they had to be all shuttled in by boat. Uh, but the worst was the spray. Um, they tried to come back to Magoo Lagoon. When it, the, the pier was damaged and the breakers were too big. So as they made a turn, uh, this young lady pictured here and seated on the left, Genevieve Force, asked one of the crewmen, can I have a life jacket, please? Nobody was wearing life jackets. And he told her, we have to wait for the next wave because they're tied to the pilot house. That next wave hit the, the ship broadside and wrecked it. Um, and only she and one other person survived. Um, and that is Kathleen Steckel, the widow of the captain of the spray. And Steckel was co-owners um, with the Weltons. And so she sold her part afterwards. We had a railroad here. You might not be aware of that. The Bakersfield and Ventura Railway Company. It was a pipe dream. They thought they were going to be able to go through Piru and up through Castaic. Um, and that's one of the engines. Um, and today, actually, part of the railroad company technically still exists. It's the um, this rail line that goes from the port up to Oxnard to the Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, but in between, what was it? It ran sugar beets from the beet dumps across the Oxnard Plain to the American Beet Sugar Company housing at Round Mountain. And so this is the only beet dump that was on the Wadalaska itself, because the Debo beet dump is a little uh, just above the Broom Ranch. Um, so what is a beet dump, you may ask, right? It's this construction here. So they built uh, the scaffolding to bring up the wagon uh, with the horses and had a special wagon where they dumped the beets down into the railroad car and then it was taken to the um, factory for processing right there. We also had a population of Basque farmers and sheep herders here. So Lewis and uh, Sloss and Gersel actually rented uh, this parcel to Don Pedro, and he liked to call himself Pierre Agor, and his great nephew, John. And after they left this area, right, he bought, Pierre bought land up in Agora Hills, which is where Agora gets its name, right? Um, but they leased the land first here. And you guys can be part of my campaign to change the name of this little hill, which is where the well is. Um, all the staff on campus call it Peanut Hill. But in the 1930 maps and 1940s maps, it is actually called Agora Hill. And if you're wondering where that is, Round Mountain is there to the right, and the star is represents where the library is located. But look at that other arrow to the north, that little farm complex, that is where the Agora family, John Agora, or John Agora, I don't speak French, uh, it's much how they pronounce it. But anyway, um, I would like to rename it Agora Hill. Satwiwa is Round Mountain, so that's Agora Hill. And folks will say the Pacific um, Southern Pacific Railroad bought the quarry off of Conejo Mountain in 1901, but from what I can see here, they actually leased it initially. So in 1901, the Sloss et al. group leased it to uh, Southern Pacific Railroad, but specifically it says in here they have to talk to the leaseholder, Pierre Gore. And then in 1918, the quarry is then sold to the Southern Pacific Railroad by Lewis. And which quarry am I talking about, right? Uh, this is what it looked like at the time. They had over 450 workers at a time, um, including um, Japanese and Chinese and Anglo-American and Mexican workers. Must have been a crazy place. Uh, but this is the, the quarry today. So it's the Pacific Rock Quarry, which you can see from the highway when you're driving 101 down to Los Angeles. Right? And today it's adjacent to the Conejo Mountain Mortuary and Cemetery. Right. And in one other tiny little factoid, the, the Pacific Quarry that was Sloss Quarry number two. And I always wondered where is Sloss Quarry number one? I think it's this. So in 1917, uh, the Flying A Studios based in Santa Barbara came here and filmed a movie called In Bad. Um, and that's at the quarry. Um, and ironically, it's about there's an archaeologist going down to Maya. So who knew that Satwiwa would be a Maya temple right, at that time? So, and then finally, kind of unusual, just for this area that you guys might not be aware of, Dos Vientos actually was part of the Lewis Ranch. And so here's a series of landowners uh, after the Lewis family lost it. So the Stewarts, um, in particular, raised Percheron horses, and then it was sold to two engineers and a um, 
evangelical preacher who tried to create a holy city up there, but um, he defaulted immediately on that. And, and then eventually Dos Vientos neighborhood started. So these last few minutes, I want to briefly talk about the Lewis family because that brings us up to the hospital. So the Lewis family uh, bought the ranch in 1906 and they held on to it until 1931, 1932. Um, and the, they're known for lima beans. There's a there, uh, there's a, a variety called the Lewis lima, which is named for the family. Um, and the lower picture, that's the ranch house, the, the ranch that they built in the ranch house. There's only one building left today. Um, and that would be this one, or actually I guess it's not working, it's a laser pointer, there we go. This tiny one right there, that is um, a low pinkish red building you can see from Lewis Road. But they're more than just farmers, right? So they uh, were inventors, they have businesses. So this is, um, they built a mercantile, founded a bank, a confectionery, and a barbershop in Old Town Camarillo and, and what was called the village. And that's today where Twisted Oak is. And that whole collection of stores, this is that where this mercantile picture was taken, right? So this is Joseph Lewis and his wife, Sarah. They had five children. Unfortunately, Henry, who's pictured here in the car, uh, the young man on the left, he was killed in an automobile accident on Christmas Day, 1910. Um, but, you know, so they lived here and raised their family here. I love the picture of the young boy. That's a, um, Joseph's grandson. And the, all these pictures were given to me by this young man's son, Terry, Terry Talley. Um, and Joseph Lewis Jr. in the lower picture on the right, he was actually one of the first foremen of the hospital ranch that was founded here later. So Joseph Lewis was an invalid for much of his life, but apparently he got around on, on his horses and uh, in this carriage and to run things. And Guy Lewis, who owned the cream colored house on Lewis Road, um, he was in charge of the horses and apparently was very good with the harnesses. And he's the one who their, led their breeding program. And so here quickly are just some pictures of the various um, ranch workers. I just love all these old pictures. Um, this bottom one was must have been before 1910 because that's Henry Lewis there next to the flag. Um, and again, imagine the workers, right? These be lima bean bags weighing uh, 80 to 100 pounds um, at a time. And they apparently preferred to use steam even when others had switched to gasoline. And this is a, a unique picture. It says... Broom Ranch, but the Lewises also owned it. And at one at the Museum of Ventura County, it's labeled as Broom Ranch harvesting a Lewis invention. So they must have been using some equipment that Lewis invented, right? And just like other farmers here, there was a switch to diversification. So it started out with lima beans and sugar beets, but it's kind of hard to tell, I know, in this particular picture. But um, over here, they'd actually started putting in a lemons. Oh, here we go. Here's the lemon orchard um, and diversifying that way, right? Which gets us back to the mystery structure, right? Which is what led to all this. And I was hoping it was part of the Lewis family, but it's not. And so you see this aerial photograph. Um, and, and then we found all these weird artifacts, mostly work industry type artifacts. Uh, some personal hygiene, some painting, maybe lots of jars, but random stuff like bullet shells and toys. So what I think is going on, as you see here, it was a quarry. At some point in the 1950s, the hospital allowed somebody to come in and quarry part of the hillside away. And so that's what I think all this is. Um, but we're still working on that. And so what I've done recently with in partnership with the Shumash and with uh, President Yao, we formed the Campus Cultural Resource Management Team where my students and I are working to help preserve the cultural history um, on campus um, and helping the Shumash and also getting them to learning their learning skills. So, and all this has been very quick. So if you wanna know more, uh, one reason I know about all this is because my book is, uh, is just coming out uh, at the end of the month on um, Rancho Wadalaska. And so you can find it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and the like. But more importantly, I hope you guys join us in August. My Several students and I have created an exhibit which will be on display in the Broom Gallery in the Broom Library and called Arriving at CI. How did, you know, how did we get to where we are today? Um, and it will be open all throughout the fall. And in, this, in the fall, also in addition to the main gallery, there will be two smaller galleries on the ground floor where we're gonna trade out exhibits and go more in depth, even more in depth than what I did today. Um, so please come to see those up there. And if you have a, a, share, a story to share, you know, if you have a connection to Wadalaska and in particular the Lewis Ranch or want more information about everything I just told you about, feel free to contact me. 
right? And with that, I think I'm ending it with 10 minutes to spare to answer questions. So thank you all for your time and attention. And I'm going to go look at the questions right now. Um, I got to go back to the bottom. Um, is the name Mom Wong Kitchen related to Mong Chung? I don't believe so, actually, because I think Wong was her father's first name, but um, that's a good question. Um, so I don't think so about that. Um, somebody asks, is there any significance to the rock, the face on the rock just east of the main campus? If you're, ta if you're talking about the one in Conejo Great, that's the only one that I'm aware of. So sorry, I can't tell you more about that one. But there is a, a face if you're coming down Conejo Grade, which was the edge of the Lewis Ranch, um, and you see a face silhouetted. And so, and I'm, I don't know the name, but the Shumash actually had a particular name for that individual um, there. And that is it for this part. Somebody asked a map. So somebody asked about the uh, expeditions that came through. So there are a at least one expedition that came through at the edge of this property, but it would have been on the Rancho Callegas property, not the actual Wadalaska. Um, although actually very corner at the top of the grade, I think where the route went through, the trail went through, that was the was the Guadalaska, but it just one tiny little part. So everything else, the Conejo Corridor, um, they came through that area. Um, the Newbury Park area that would have been on either the Conejo or the or the Cayegas ranches. I know I whipped through all this very quickly, um, but the whole point here was to lead up to um, the next uh, presentation, right, which sp focuses specifically on uh, the hospital, right, which a portion of this land, uh, the Lewis has owned 8,200 acres, 8,200 acres, about 1400 of which was bought by the state for the mental hospital so only a portion of the lewis ranch became the hospital i don't see any other questions anybody thinking of anything else that you want to type in if not we can hand it over to daniel This was great, Dr. Delaney. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone for your participation today, asking some great questions. This seminar has been recorded and will be placed in our OLLI events page at the end of the seminar series. We invite you to our, our next one again on Thursday, May 4th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. to learn more about the history of the Camarillo State Hospital. Each seminar that we're offering of the three are a separate registration link. So you need to register specifically to the ones that you want to choose uh, so you can attend. Evelyn Taylor, our university archivist, will be presenting in a panel discussion with former state hospital employees and a historian will follow. And Dr. Delaney will also be here again to serve as our moderator for that discussion. Again, thank you very much for coming and have a great, wonderful, beautiful day. Take care.